Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Well, you heard the last line of the gospel this morning called, Many are called, but few are chosen. Either you're called or chosen. So let's look at the words called and chosen. I like doing word studies in the concordance. And I found out that called is reference number 2822, and the Greek word is kletos, and it means invited. It's pretty obvious, called, invited. Remember we heard in the gospel this morning, the wedding feast. Many were invited, but not all came to the wedding feast. It's like receiving a wedding invitation from your friend that they're gonna get married. And so you're invited to this wedding, and so you, you get this invitation in the mail, or email, or however, and you're all excited and you look at the date and you write the date down and so forth and you put the invitation in a safe place but what if you misplaced it and forgot and you missed the wedding you were invited but you did not participate in the event so what about the word chosen reference number 1588 eclitos describes the people who choose to follow the Lord. See the difference between being invited and choose to follow the Lord. So this parable has basically three parts. <clears throat> the first, the king sends out servants to invite the guest to his son's marriage feast. But they make light of it, refuse to come and kill the messengers. The angry king sends his troops to wipe them out and burn their city. Well, I guess they call that holy retribution. Now another part of the parable, and remember it's a parable. Jesus talked in parables here. And he compares the parable to the kingdom of God. So keep that in mind. Second part, the king sends more servants out to invite others to the feast. Everyone they find, the good and the bad. And then one more part. The third part deals with the discovery of a guest at the banquet that does not have a wedding garment. He's cast out of the assembly. He placed in darkness with the gnashing of teeth. Horrible. The major theme of the Lord's life was his criticism of the religious authorities at his time. He realized he did not make friends with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders. They had a real issue with Christ coming because he kind of turned over the apple cart and he brought light to the Mosaic law and they were too steeped in their traditions and and what do, how do I say it the law was more important than compassion when Jesus was walking one day saw a fig tree he was hungry and he went up to this fig tree and was bare so he cursed it. And the apostles were amazed. It withered and died. And the church fathers tell us that's a picture of Israel. They bore no fruit during Jesus' time. They were too wrapped up in the, in the Judaism, following the law of Moses. They invited guests who snubbed their noses at the king and were punished represent those who turned Judaism into a religion of law and ritual, forgetting about the spirit that animated it. We know Christ came for the salvation of mankind. 
But he also came to breathe fresh air into the law of Moses. And they didn't have, they wouldn't, they don't want to hear anything about that. Because you're not going to come against the law of Moses. Now the extreme reaction of the king represents God's judgment on the religious authorities that remembered the law, but who had forgotten the weightier things which are mercy, justice, and compassion. The servants who were murdered in the parable are the prophets. The second group of servants who were sent out is the apostles and the disciples of Christ who brought the good news to this lost and dying world. Those who accepted the invitation included the poor, the sick, the sinners of all kinds, the depressed, the outcasts of society, the Gentiles, the good and the bad. Everybody was invited. But, but remember the story, the man that was not properly dressed, I guess he's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Maybe he represents the one who slips into the assembly with evil intent. That's what the devil does, doesn't he? The early church was embroiled in an argument between the Judaizers who wanted to impose the Judaic laws on the church and the, and the followers of St. Paul who opposed them. They wanted them to be circumcised. Thankfully, St. Paul won the day. But the temptation to return to that, that, that form of legalism remains a problem even till this day. We can get into legalism. In the Orthodox Church, we can get into this legalism. Does not the Lord want us to be compassionate, love the creation, pray for one another? Maybe the Lord would have much the same to say to us as He did to the rulers of the temple. Orthodoxy is very physical. We see, we hear, we smell all the things that we use in the liturgy to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. I emphasize spirit and truth. Don't look. Come into church, become rote, become mundane. I'm going to go to liturgy again because it's required of me and not have that spirit, that Holy Spirit that gives life and, and you come to the liturgy to worship the Lord Jesus Christ not do a bunch of rules yes we have rules in the church but the rules are for our benefit but don't let the rules override the love of the brethren yeah, have you ever heard the slogan what would Jesus do I've seen rubber band wristbands it says what would WWJD what would Jesus do good question what would Jesus do in this situation? Sounds pretty, pretty safe. As you go about your life, before you do anything, what would Jesus do? Of course, we are to be in prayer and supplication before we make any decisions. We start the morning in prayer and we end the evening in prayer. So us, what would Jesus do can be dangerous. You say, how so? What did Jesus do when he was here on this earth? Do we want to be numbered among the sinners and crucified? Best, be, best not ask the question. Jesus loved to associate with outcasts and sinners. He loved them so much, his enemies said he was one of them. They even called him Beelzebub. He was the devil himself. Demon possessed. Even his family thought him crazy. But Jesus came to this earth for the salvation of mankind. Incarnate. You know the story, the gospel story. Jesus, we just celebrate the, the nativity of the Blessed Mother of God who became the vessel that God chose and she agreed to bring forth the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, in a miracle way. Jesus angered the religious authorities. Breaking ritual laws and customs. Remember going out in the field and eating the grain tops? And they came, whoa, they didn't wash their hands. And Jesus had to talk to them about that. And they don't want to hear it. 
they, they were so steeped in their um, mosaic law and following the, the customs and so forth that they their hearts were closed and couldn't hear what Jesus had to say. He angered the religious authorities so much he was considered irreligious, an enemy of the Jewish law. The Lord totally upset the apple cart. Who is the Logos? The Lord is the Logos, isn't he? And anytime you read the Old Testament, it's still, it wasn't written by the Lord. If he's the word of God and all that, is not all scripture inspired of the Holy Spirit? Moses wrote the first five books and then on we go with the rest of the, of the books of the Old Testament and then we move into the New Testament. Father Alexander Schmemann of Blessed Memory taught that Jesus represents the, really the end of that religion. And he did not come to found a new one. Jesus came to bring life, not to construct another temple. Even though, are we not supposed to be the temple of the Holy Spirit? There is a temple being built within our heart. As long as you give your life to God and, and uh, deny thyself and take up thy cross and follow the Lord. What did the Lord say to Fratini at the well? There will come a time when those who worship God will not worship in Jerusalem or on this mountain, but will worship the God in spirit and truth. And we have to keep that in our mind. When we come to the liturgy in a temple, in this place where we have all the icons and the lamps burning, and it's beautiful, it's like, it's like stepping into heaven. For a little bit of time, we, we're, on, we're in the world, but not of it. We come into this temple, and we connect with our Lord in a mystical manner. So the church, the ecclesia, is not a club for the elite, for the righteous few. And there's a name for that. It's called cult. Are we? Some people may think, because you're orthodox, you're in a cult. The church fathers tell us the church is not a cult, but a hospital for saints. Sounds, I think it was John Chrysostom. The Sabbath was made for man, not the man for the Sabbath. And there's not one of us among us who does not need to change. We need to change. We all need to repent moment by moment and walk differently than the world because it's so easy to return evil for evil if someone says this you go wow back at them god doesn't want us to do that so we got to have we need to let the holy spirit correct us remember the devil brings condemnation he attacks us from the outside on the five senses he brings condemnation but the holy spirit is an inside job because it brings conviction the Holy Spirit says, don't do it. The flag should go off, don't do it. And then you have a choice. Yeah, I want to do it. No, you don't want to do it. Then there's that battle that goes on and either you're going to be victorious in Christ and not do it, the sins, or you're going to fall and think of yourself more than Christ. And that's what really sin is. You think of yourself more than God. Aren't we able to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us by obedience to following the commandments of Christ? I hear people say, well, well that sounds like an old law. Commandments. Well, God has given us commandments. Love one another. That's a big one. Think about this. <laughs> this is kind of silly. But if we remove all the sinners from the church, who's going to be left? Nobody. It'll be an empty hall. It'll be an empty temple. That wedding garment becomes a garment of love as opposed to a garment of law. Jesus tries to bring, when he was incarnated and he walked this earth for that some 30 some years, he was trying to bring, show the love of God the Father. And they didn't want to hear it. Even St. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, had a problem with that. He was killing Christians until the Lord intervened. Maybe the, the guest who came 
not properly dressed with a wedding garment, maybe he would be the one to cast the first stone at the woman caught in adultery. I don't know. Can we? Can we cast the stone? No, we can't. The Lord could have. He was sinless, but he didn't. He used mercy and love and told her, go and sin no more. If you pay really close attention to the divine liturgy, in which we are here to worship the Lord in spirit and truth, we hear a prayer that should uh, stop us in our tracks. Those who are bound with desires and pleasures of the flesh are not worthy to approach or draw near to serve thee, O King of glory. Pretty powerful line in the liturgy. So, usually where all of us are bound with desires and pleasures of the flesh. But we still come here. God says, be holy for I am holy. And that's why the Holy Communion is so important because when you receive the body and blood of Christ, you're being deified. You're being made more like Christ. And, and someone said, oh, we would take communion twice a year. Why? Does not the scripture say take it often? And the more you take communion, the more you prepare correctly to receive the body and blood of Christ, the more you become like Christ. Isn't that interesting? His body, his blood, and you become more like him. Everybody with the desire and humility are welcome to draw near to God in this holy temple. I call it a temple because there is a sacrifice, a bloodless sacrifice going on on the altar in the second part of the, of the divine liturgy. We have that sacrifice. So the Lord tells us, are we to distinguish between the tares and the wheat? Let's tear up those tares, get them out, so we so the wheat will grow and be large in its crop. The Lord said, "No, don't do that. Let the wheat and the tares grow together, and I'm going to send the angels, and they're going to be the reapers, and they're going to cut down all of it, and they're going to take the wheat into the barn, and then the tares are going to burn. But we don't. If we go out there in our self righteousness and try to." pull out the tares, we may yank out some of the uh, some of the wheat, as the, as the parable told us. Only God can tell the difference. Only God can be the judge. We cannot judge. If we judge, we will be judged with that same measure. We don't know who's in the parish. We don't know where they're at spiritually. We don't know if they're spiritual giants or just infants. We don't know that. All we have to do is love the flock equally, unconditionally, like Jesus did. It's our job to put on that garment of love. Love one another. Well, I don't like Joe over there because he's a scoundrel. Mm. Well, maybe he'll repent. And you don't know when he's going to repent. You don't know. And then next thing you know, you're going to have egg on your face saying, oh, what did I do? And then you're going to be in confession and repenting and you got to go up and make things right with Joe or whoever it is. I always, why do I say Joe? I don't know. It just hap happens to be a quick name I throw out. It could be anybody. You go to church, not to look at beautiful hats and clothes and all that stuff. We go there to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and in the second part of the liturgy, we, with anticipation, wait for the consecration of the holy gifts, the bread and the wine, to be made by the Holy Spirit into the body and blood of Christ, that we can take this, this divine gift from God. You say, well, is Jesus here? Yeah, he's here. And you're going to find that Jesus is on that altar in the form of bread and wine becomes his body and blood. We will have Christ dwelling in us. Think about that. You know, you ever bake a cake or do any cooking, you have the recipe. You have to have a recipe. Now, if you don't follow the recipe, it usually turns out to be a mess. It doesn't come out right. People go, what is that? Because you're going to serve this, whatever you're baking or cooking, but the recipe has a certain ingredient list, and then you have to prepare it and cook it and all that stuff. Think about us. Each one of us has our own recipe. We're unique before God. We are 
We're not cookie cutters. God doesn't go, there's the John, you know, keep going. They're all the same. No, they're not. We're all different. And God deals with us in a different way. So who are we to say, point the finger at that person and say, hmm, you're not like me. Thank God. So we're not to go there, are we? We're to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep us on the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Keep our eyes on the Lord. And everybody that, and, and I tell you, everybody that you know and is around us, there's a reason why they're around us. Let your light shine so people will be drawn. They'll say, why are you different? Why are you different than me? Well, maybe it's because I'm trying to follow the Lord and do His commandments and be pleasing unto Him. Because you can, you can be unpleasing to the Lord. Did not he say, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And he was lifted up. And that possibility is there for us that many are called, but few are chosen. And I said in the beginning of this message, the reason those who are invited don't come because they don't choose to let the Lord be the Lord of their life. He says, if you love me, saith the Lord, you will do my commandments. They are not a burden, but we find the commandments of Christ is life. And one of the biggest commandments is taking of the body and blood of Christ. We have to prepare ourselves. We have to be repent, confess. We have to come and get in that communion line like this. We come in with our hand, arms crossed over our heart but come in humility, asking for the Lord to share His body and blood with us. What a marvelous gift the Lord has given us at the, some people call it the Last Supper, but I like to call it the Mystical Supper, because we don't know how that all happens. You can do a chemical analysis of that bread and wine, and it still looks like bread and wine, but because we've asked for the Holy Spirit to come and change these gifts into the body and blood of Christ. And also we say, change us. You'll hear that in a little bit. In the liturgy, you'll hear the priest will say, and change us. Yes, we ask for the gifts to be changed, but Lord, change us. Because we need to be changed. We need to be changed like Jesus came in, on this earth and tried to change the Jew, the, the, the Jewish people, Israel. He tried to come and not all of them rejected him. The re religious elite, they, he had a problem with that. They even stood at the praetorium and Pilate says, which we do, which I do with Jesus, crucify him, they yelled, mob mentality. And they, they asked, curse, they asked for a blood curse upon them and their children. If you can imagine that, how insane that was. And they said, we have no king, get this now, we have no king but Caesar. They denied the king of glory, right there. And why not? They willingly made that, that proclamation and the curse maybe they're still reeling from it today but I tell you the curse can be broken all you got to do is come to Jesus isn't that easy sounds so easy but man fights it all the way mankind can fight that all the way to the grave oh no I don't want to do that I want to do this I want to go my way you know the song I did it my way boy I think that stinks to heaven because I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it the Lord's way because who has all the perfect wisdom? Who has the wisdom that we don't have? It's the Lord of glory. He has the wisdom to give us these good gifts. And then did not Solomon ask for wisdom, not riches? Because with the wisdom, you make the right choices. And we say in the liturgy several times, wisdom, wisdom. So that's we're asking for Christ to fill our hearts with his wisdom. Because our my wisdom, pew, stinks. It's it's like the 
dead men, dead men's bones. They stink it. And Jesus had a lot to say about the, about the Sadducees and Pharisees, didn't he? He says, uh, you're, you look great on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. He can see right into their heart. And the Lord can look right into our heart. And he wants us to, to be part of the chosen group that we would choose to follow the Lord. That's all we have to do. By choosing to follow the Lord, become citizens of heaven. Even though we fall and we sin and we, and we can repent and come back in. I mean, you get baptized. When you baptize, you put on a beautiful white robe, don't you? And wear a cross. But then as soon as you fall into sin, it's stained. But it can be cleaned by Christ is not he the author and the perfecter of our faith he can clean that garment all you got to do is agree with him Lord I've sinned I've done evil in my sight have mercy upon me a great sinner and repent and it's, it's amazing how the blood washes you clean bright and new just like your baptism garment that you wore when you were baptized is beautifully white it can be white again and God can remove that stain of sin by our repentance is the means of salvation. So I hope that listening to this message that you will be part of the chosen. You're in, all are invited, but you'll be part of the chosen to follow the Lord to his kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory to God. And that's that. Wow.